Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, the title of this panel is Awakening to a Digital World. As you all know, uh, COVID-19 has exposed a lot of the benefits of technology um, nowadays in a world that is growing more and more dependent on it so that we can not only do our emotional uh, our emotional connections with our loved ones, but also our work lives. Um, however, this time has also exposed some troubles that um, people have when accessing technology becomes difficult, be it because they don't have a lot of broadband access or they don't have the right devices to access technology. And this issue is usually referred to as the digital divide. And this is obviously has a ton of impact on not only um, us as citizens and our productivity, economic output, but it also has a lot of social, social impact. Um, and in this panel, what we're looking to is really discuss what are ways that we can mitigate that as we're moving forward. And how can governments and private industry hopefully work together to help mitigate that impact. Um, the way we're gonna be structuring this panel is we're first gonna be really explaining the problem. What is the digital divide? What are some of the top salient points that really um, contribute to it? Then we're gonna be discussing potential solutions. And lastly, we're gonna be taking questions from the audience. By all means, please feel free to add in your questions or comments directly in the chat. Um, I'll make sure to cue the panelists with some of them as they come along, or we'll reserve them for the end portion where we're gonna be doing a live Q&A. Um, and without further ado, I would like to introduce my fellow panelists. So I would want, uh, whenever I start speaking, if you can raise your hand so the rest of the public knows, who I'm referencing to, it's really hard to tell on the screen of just gridded pictures. <laughs> um, I'll start with Sam. So Samuel Huber, he's the founder of AdMix, is a lead, leading monetization platform for game and um, sports. And they've raised uh, over $10 million in funding. He's a regular contributor of Forbes, VentureBeat, and The Next Web, and many other publications where he shares his thoughts and experiences about the future of media and the frontier technologies like virtual or augmented realities. Um, thank you, Sam, for joining us today. Welcome. Florence, if you could please raise your hand. Hi, Florence. Um, Florence Machant, she's a CFA. Um, she founded Never Tech Late LLC after completing a fellowship at Harvard's Advanced Leadership Initiative Never Tech Late actually advocates for advanced, um, expanded use of social media technology to enhance the well-being of older adults and actually promote engagement and lifelong learning. Ms. Mochant also serves on the board of the French American Chamber of Commerce and was named the Chevalier of the Order of the Economic Palms by the French government. She has earned her graduate degree from the Institut Commercial in Nancy, France, and her MBA from Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Thank you, Florence, for joining us today. Yeah. Next, I'm gonna introduce John. John, if you could raise your hand, please. Hi, everyone. Hi, John. John Soberg is a managing partner at MSN AB Ventures, an early stage venture capital firm focused on the venture, on the future of finance and building a sustainable society. John has made over 120 investments and held over 40 boards, board seats and observed for positions across five continents. As an entrepreneur, John had an IPO exit at AdForce. He holds an engineering degree from Harvey Mott College at Northwestern University and an MBA from Palmer Scholar at Wharton and a senior fellow at the Wharton Customer Analytics. John, thanks so much for joining us today. We're looking forward to our discussion. Amy, if you could please raise your hand. Hi, Hi, Amy, welcome to our panel. 
Amy Peck, she's the founder and CEO of Endeavor VR, a leading global global VR and AR XR <laughs> um, strategy and consulting firm. She's a recognized thought leader in the space and speaks globally on the future of XR and exponential technologies. She has a deep connections within the industry and works with Fortune 500 companies, digital media production companies, and tech startups. Um, um, just in general, general production companies to help them develop content, products, uh, and just general management. Thank you so much, Amy, for joining us today. And last but not least, um, I also want to introduce Orlando. If you could please raise your hand. Thank you. Hi, Orlando. Um, Orlando Remedios, he's a co-founder and CEO of Sense, Sense Affinity and has vast R&D and innovation management experiences. In his previous role, he was creating the MTN business as well as its surrounding ecosystem in the Silicon Valley and Portugal for Nokia. Prior to that, Orlando was heading uh, research and development for the reporting and analysis business area, as well as IPTV and network management with teams located in countries as diverse as Denmark, Germany, India, and Portugal. His team has an excellent innovation track record, having been responsible for over 40 patents in the past 10 years. Orlando has a computer science degree from, I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce this very well, Hoshush Klein Mine, I did my best, <laughs> as well as postgraduate in business administration from the University of Liverpool. Thank you so much, Orlando, for joining us today. Welcome to the panel. Um, and my name is Sylvia. I'm going to be moderating the panel. Um, Sylvia Vaquer, um from San Francisco, California, based here. I started a, a digital agency almost 10 years ago. And we really explore the intersection of technology, strategy, and creativity, particularly as it applies to social impact ventures. Um, and I'm really hoping we can bring um, some insight into today's discussion. Um, okay, without further ado, I'm gonna move very quickly into simply explaining the problem and what really we're trying to discuss here. Can, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, I, um, I think we lost Sam. I'm hoping he can rejoin very quickly. It's, Fingers crossed, technology, always the promise of technology, never fully fulfilled. But that's part of what we're doing today. <laughs> so, okay. So COVID-19, as I was uh, mentioning at the top of the panel, has very much um, uncovered how important a digital connection can be, not only for fulfilling our emotional and so social needs, particularly when many parts of the world have been forced to shelter in place and um, we've been unable to connect with our loved ones in many ways. Um, but beyond that, it has been the means through which many have been able to continue working throughout this period, something that would have been impossible to do even 20 years back, if not less. And so the the opportunity that technology brings to us is is huge um however we have to understand that um access to technology and the distribution of that technology is not equal and this pandemic has exacerbated the fact that those that do not have equal access to technology are increasingly being left behind and so um, I want to explain to everyone who's joining us what this issue that we're trying to tackle is all about. What we call this is called the digital divide. And the main obstacles um, for being able to access technology are first and foremost, lack of access to a reliable internet. There's, yes, increasingly many parts of the world have 3G, even 4G access. But unfortunately, that doesn't necessarily translate into fast and reliable internet for everyone. Um, that is either due to infrastructure, as I was mentioning, not enough 
cell towers, not enough um, companies providing the services or um, not enough governments prioritizing this uh, network infrastructure as part of their development goals. But also there is economic limitations um, in a country, for example, like the United States, where a lot of the services of telecommunications have been privatized, a lot of access to fast and reliable internet mostly depends on your ability to be able to pay for that service in an ongoing basis. So that's one of the issues that um, adds on to the digital divide. The second issue is just simply not having internet enabled devices. And I, I know for some, this might sound um, incredible, but there's many, many parts of the developing world and of the developed world uh, who don't, many people don't have um, it, enough internet enabled devices. And by that, I mean, many people just are able to access internet through their cell phones. And sometimes the cell phones are maybe first generation smartphones, if that. And so their access to the internet is actually quite limited. Not, not a video call like we're able to have right now or a conference or full blown, you know, immersive experiences like VR. Um, so, Third, the, one of the third obstacles is, is just not really understanding how to use these devices. And this is a huge issue because um, this affects not only um, those who might not have access to these devices and then all of a sudden have them, but also is something that affects um, other people in this social economic spectrum. If you think of the elderly or the very young, they can be prone to a lot of abuses while they learn how to properly use um, these internet enabled devices because of cyber crimes or so many other other things. And then um, leading into this issue is uh, the lack of digital literacy. And that, that's another very big one because um, even people who are very knowledgeable and skilled in using technology can sometimes fall prey of cyber crimes um, or even like fragmentation and polarization based on um, our current trends in social media. So those are some things that are, are really contributing to this problem. And just to put things in perspective, as I was saying, this is not even, not something that only affects developing countries. Developing countries are of course affected um, in bigger numbers. But even a country as developed, quote unquote, as the United States where the internet was invented, only 56% of households with an incomes under $30,000 actually have access to broadband internet. And this has been really impactful for those who have students, um, school grade children, or even um, university grade children who are trying to complete their studies during the COVID-19 crisis, and they're simply unable to just because they don't have the right access to the, to the platforms and the tools. So um, the, low, the low income households, as I was mentioning, seem to be generally the most vulnerable to falling behind in, in the digital divide. Um, there are many other groups in our society who are affected. Um, and as I was mentioning earlier, older adults is a, is a big group that sometimes gets misunderstood and miscategorized. So Florence, I would want to call on you on your expertise um, in founding and actually uh, a company that helps tackle this issue. Can you please expand on this? Sure, and thank you for this very clear, uh, which is, I think, difficult uh, explanation of, of what, you know, the digital situation and the digital divide is, um, because I think it's, it's very difficult to actually measure it. And I like to use uh, two different um, statistics, um, which I believe are very interestingly similar. I will try to address the uh, the, this question uh, by looking at first the growth of the older population. 
um, it's a phenomenon that is global. Um, and here are the stats in the US. Between 2008 and 2018, the population in the US alone, but uh, there are similar uh, trends in the rest of the world, increased from 39 million to 53 million in 10 years, from 2008 to 2018. That's a 35% increase. And according to the U.S. Census Bureau, this same population is supposed to increase uh, to a point where it will represent about 20% of our population, so in the United States, by 2030. That's only 10 years ago. And then we have the, 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 the growth of technology, which is really difficult to understand how it affects our professional and personal life. But if we take, for example, as a benchmark, the iPhone, which is one of the most popular, if not the most popular smartphone, between the same decade of 2008 and 2018, um, the number of iPhones sold increased from 12 million to 218 million in 2018. And interestingly enough, these two growth trends did not merge. Um, we don't see an increase of digital acceptance in the older adults uh, population, as you, as you mentioned, according to the Pew Institute, there is um, growing, growing access for older adults, about 50% now access have access to broadband. Um, but of course, that changes according to the education and the social economic levels, which of course it declines. So although having access is a hurdle, and, and, and Sylvia, you outlined uh, that, that hurdle in terms of not having broadband or not having the, the hardware, what... Uh, I also am very intrigued by, uh, by and finding a solution. It's actually um, the, the issue of being engaged with technology. And COVID-19 has, has emphasized many pre-existing factors in our world. But the social isolation of the older adults and its disastrous health and emotional consequences certainly has been most emphasized. And why is that? Even in the case when the, the older adult um, has access to hardware, such as a smartphone, a laptop, or even better, a tablet, there is still a need for education. And surprisingly, the, the instruction manual that actually does not even come now with your phone does not quite make it for this education. So from our experience at Never Take Late, and based on, on, on a lot of academic research that we have pulled, we list three uh, major barriers for a teaching program for this digital uh, gap to be breached. Um, one, there's a perception that technology for the older adult and maybe for other part of the population uh, is too much and too complex. Uh, the second thing is that there is a feeling of inadequacy and, and comparison between young and old people toward technology. And then the third, and I think that's the most intriguing for an educator, is the lack of confidence in the ability to learn about technology at this later part of life. So solutions to now the, the, the digital divide in this population, I believe, do exist. Uh, but they will have to include an acknowledgement of these barriers. Great. Thank you so much, Florence, for uh, that input. I'm not sure if anyone else in the panel would like to chime in on what are other groups that are sometimes overlooked when we're talking about the digital digital divide, but that actually um, are as affected, if not more, by this issue. If not, we're going to, I think, Florence, you preempted it very well. We're going to jump directly into um, the part of the panel where we start discussing some potential solutions. As I was mentioning earlier, this is a very highly nuanced issue um, that we need to address as it is super de detrimental, and you were really referencing to some of those, those issues. Um, it has very detrimental effects on the social well-being and the economic pro production that really impact us all. Florence, you mentioned um, just the, the whole fact of isolation and how that has some very detrimental consequences from a social emotional well-being. So there are some ways to mitigate the impact of um, the digital divide. Um, and these are very much in line with some of the things that the UN Secretary General discussed earlier um, this year 
when it comes to really helping um, helping alleviate this issue, which, which is increasingly becoming a very big issue for the world. So first and foremost, helping provide affordable and robust broadband internet service, um, providing access to internet enabled devices, educating, providing some digital literacy training, and giving quality technical support to some people, particularly those that are less knowledgeable. And then last but not least, uh, creating applications and providing content that can help, um, that can help mitigate some of the issues we were discussing above. Okay, so how can we begin to address some of these? In what ways can governments and private industry work together to help solve some of these issues? John, could you please help us elaborate a little bit on this topic? Sure. Um, but yes, and thank you. So I think my background as a VC has been more focused on the private side of this equation in the grand scheme of things. But what I think COVID has uncovered or for a lot of people and, you know, we're seeing this, this huge, um, difference now in, in the haves and have nots, um, is the fact that, you know, people maybe assumed that governments were going to provide kind of basic necessities or, some of this infrastructure. And realistically, that's just not the case. Um, maybe because this hasn't been considered to be crucial, uh, uh, crucially important or, you know, kind of uh, a stable necessity like water or electricity or something like that. But I think COVID is showing us that it really is. And when you look into the future, um, 10 years from now, a lot of jobs are going to be dependent on on having broadband access and and being able to work with technology. So I think the the good news in this is that what we're seeing is that there's there's some alignments that people might not have expected. Um, if you look at the big technology companies in Silicon Valley, some of them are really actively working to provide broadband access, you know, ubiquitously. You look at um, you know, SpaceX putting launching a, a bunch of satellites that would be able to to give internet access to everyone. Uh, Google and Facebook. If you think about their markets already, the best way for them to grow their revenues is to get more people online. So um, that may or may not seem like the the uh, the the greatest reason for for doing this, but but the reality is that 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 alignment may be very helpful for people in need. Um, and then I think for me, I, I have not been as much uh, an investor on the infrastructure side as I have been on the um, a lot on the financial inclusion um, types of things that are a little bit different, but also training and trying to build more sustainable futures. And I think where we're seeing a ton of activity now is not just platforms like this one that are that are able to do video uh, and really kind of change the way we work, but we're seeing a, a big kind of spike too in in online education. Um, you know, the universities are having to deal with this too and trying to figure out how they can educate people remotely. I think we're going to come out of this, and and the next couple of years we're going to see huge innovation and 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 very positive developments in trying to get uh, good technical education to people in need. And so you mentioned it's it's not just sort of third world countries that we're talking about. Um, when I'm working with people and you know trying to work on sustainability, it's often just certain parts of of countries. The U.S. has has a lot of places that don't have very good access, and I think people would be shocked to to kind of to understand what that looks like in in parts of America. Uh, and that is true in different parts of, of the world also. So I think we should be thinking about this as a global a global problem. And so where I try to focus my attention is aligning capital with uh, with the the needs that that we have. And I think we're seeing a lot more money and a lot more attention drawn. And so I think it's very positive. Um, I, there's there's I gave a couple of examples. We, there's also really innovative solutions. There's uh, companies that are 
training people in uh, software development remotely in, in, in parts of Africa that then they, they get hired into Silicon Valley companies like Andela. Um, there's, uh, there's, there's some companies that are, that are providing remote um, solar powered electricity generators that you can drop into a remote place anywhere and then that could potentially power your your internet and your and your devices. So I think we're we're finding some really innovative solutions that are making things possible in places that it that it might have been difficult before. Um, so I'm I'm very optimistic about the the capabilities, and I think it's just about trying to get those capabilities to the right places and the right people. Thank you so much, uh, John. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else in the panel would like to chime in. Yeah, sure. I think I think um, John touched on so many issues that are that are really important here. You know, w one of them is is an architecture piece, right? And 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 sort of a, an access and sort of network architecture. Uh, and the other piece is, of course, access to the hardware itself. And we saw this with uh, mobile devices. And so, if we can look at you know, how challenging it was to get mobile devices in the hands of, you know, the sort of lower economic strata, and, but, but what a difference it makes with that access. Uh, and for that to happen, you know, there has to be some kind of, sadly, commercial and financial motivation and gain for companies to do that. Um, but we have to decide, you know, as a globe, like it's been interesting. COVID has been really interesting because we've had to galvanize globally. Governments have had to sort of put things aside and work together. And so if we want to move forward, we need to stop, you know, reacting on our heels to things and get in front of some, some of these problems. And, you know, that's why this um, conference itself is so important is that we talk about these issues. And uh, this dovetails into all of the larger issues that, that we're facing. It's not just access. You know, we're talking about um, diverse workforces and education and knowledge transfer. Um, you know, AARP released uh, a, a great VR application called Alcove. But we need to teach them how to use these, you know, virtual headsets to be able to interact in those environments. And so, you know, it's it's really important for us to decide how to service sort of globally, um, you know, th these sort of, you know, fractions of, of, uh, of the population. Um, and having a diverse workforce means training, means access. But think of the benefits of, of having a truly global, diverse workforce bringing in their talents and skills from other cultures and what the the ultimate economic benefit of, of of access in all of these remote areas, not just the U.S. but globally, and you know that that have challenges and and start to really think of uh, you know politics and government, at, at, you know in this global village construct, and that seems you know sort of Pollyanna-ish and naive, but it it's. It is an absolute necessity for us to move forward on all of these fronts, and we have to start removing uh, conceptual borders and and allow this this uh, you know kind of think tank uh, you know to to solve some of these problems. I mean, we're here to do that, but we can't just have these conversations once a year and then go away about our, our business. We need to enact some change and we need to start at the local and municipal level and then on a country level and then on a global level. And we'll talk a little, I know we're going to circle around to um, how virtual environments can be helpful in kind of shrinking the globe. Um, but it's really up to us as constituents of, you know, whatever cities and towns and countries we live in is to start having a voice and start wrapping our arms around what this technology means and making it accessible to everyone because it, it truly does benefit all of us. But because we don't see immediate gains, it's very difficult to think about how to build the infrastructure to support it. Very, very good points, both John and Amy. Thank you so much. Um, and, and on the heels of that, Amy, I would want to ask Orlando, so I know you've been working for many years in the kind of innovation and how innovation can, technology can really em help empower a different world. Um, and I would want to hear your point of view on how do you think innovation can help us address and tackle some of these really hairy, complex issues? 
Yes, uh, actually, it's uh, it's quite uh, interesting uh, how how this year actually panned out. The pandemic basically showed us that uh, uh, what the industry has been working on for the fif uh, last fifty years basically holds the the solution on how we can work in the future. But uh, in reality, when Douglas Engelbert um, foresaw how we can also uh, all work uh, remotely and uh, work uh, collaboratively uh, in a digital way, um, basically we continued for, for the next 50 years to build out the infrastructure in cities, all, co all commuting to the same places, and basically working locally with digital tools. Now, actually, now the pandemic brought to us really the visibility that while we have actually built out all the systems that we need, we built the internet, we built digital uh, documenting, uh, documentation systems, databases, and communication systems, we have actually focused on the smart city. And uh, we have completely forgotten that the idea was actually to to move and uh, to to bring this connectivity to everywhere in the world. Now we have to execute that in a, a very expedited fashion. That, 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 that's the, basically the the big uh, the big uh, uh, challenge that we have now. We have the tools, but now we have to see how we can, in in a timely fashion, bring this without causing more pain and and more. Um, more harm to, to people which are already disfavored. And that's the problem with the digital divide, how we can bring them into this process. We see today that uh, since we were not prepared, a lot of people who were at, uh, homeschooled or uh, students which uh, had to, to, to work from home and didn't have the, the tools to, to be really effective, basically lost half a year uh, up to one year. And uh, we see that the pandemic Will will still be with us for the next six to to nine months. So um, the current generation may be losing one year, one and a half year of uh, their development time just because we didn't achieve to to bring this uh, technology uh, outside. I think it's now really time for for companies, for startups to think what is the next step. Now, what I see panning out is really that solutions which can really bring this digital digital connectivity to to, fru to fruition in a in a um, in a distributed way where really the communities can contribute uh, remotely to to the bigger piece will be uh, will, will be the the game changers and 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 these companies and startups and uh, um, these systems will be able to to really bring the the next uh, the next evolution in our society. But of course, they need now to, to really rely on infrastructure programs and uh, networks which will, will be able to bring this, uh, this connectivity to this uh, remote sites. And, and that's a challenge to, to really fulfill in the next, uh, in the next uh, nine months. So it's uh, really a, a, an investment uh, necessary for that. And we see that Europe is uh, very focused on, on investing uh, in the digitalization of um, of the um, of the regions, and I think it's a, a very good step because it, it will be really the the focus of the next few years and how we will work. This will basically also mean that uh, the way how how the European society will be structured will change from cities to regions again. A little bit like what we see already. In Germany, Germany is very uh, decentralized. It's not really focused on cities like uh, uh, like uh, other countries. And I, I guess that a lot of other countries will uh, start to look into that model and start to see how really um, the evolution of uh, smaller to medium sized uh, um, cities can be really uh, feasible now because it brings a, a higher quality to people and uh, the way how also people can work. And uh, I guess that, that, that can be really something that uh, technology will bring f forth now. And uh, actually, it was in the, in, the, in the beginning of the internet, in the beginning of the digital systems, it was the, the vision. And uh, we just uh, kind of forgot the vision in, in the last 50 years. And now we are actually pressed to fulfill it.
<laughs> very, very valid point. Um, and I think to your to your point, Orlando, um, it will be a collaboration of what you were saying, like local gov. And Amy, you mentioned in this early, earlier, local governments and um, entities providing certain kind of um, incentives, so to speak, um, so that they can engage the right the right set of private companies who have been developing these technologies and are very good at innovation and are very good at making this quickly and expeditiously um, and then uh, help enabling them to implement that at scale in a way that it positively impacts a larger swath of the population that have been largely ignored. Um, and so to this point, how do you think, Amy, that emerging technologies like AR, VR, even gaming, could potentially help alleviate the digital divide? Yeah, there we go. To take myself off mute. Yeah. So, well, gaming is actually interesting. I'm glad you brought that up because we sort of dismiss gaming um, just because it sort of falls in this entertainment realm, but we saw, you know, Pokemon Go sort of capture the hearts and minds of people globally. Uh, and you're starting to see, um, you know, games and, and entertainment and social media actually collide. Um, you saw Travis Scott in uh, performing in Fortnite. We saw um, The weekend performing in TikTok. Um, what's important about that is the behaviors and these kind of online behaviors and, and you know, that the sort of next generation being able to interact globally. And I know I keep kind of harping on this notion of a global village, but we, we have to start at the municipal and the city level and build these programs so that we have, you know, city structures that uh, can pilot programs that can then be, you know, sort of, you know, managed globally around the world. When I talk about infrastructure, I'm talking about all of the network capabilities and infrastructure um, and, you know, ed edge compute, 5G and all of those technologies kind of combining um, where uh, XR technology is, is going to be very valuable is is we can work in virtual environments and for education i mean i've been talking about this for for many years um, and it's why i'm very very interested actually in florence's work you know we can completely remove boundaries and we can start educating in classrooms in virtual environments and this can start from you know even you know middle school uh, and, and then continue through college. And I think that the construct of this, you know, you do K through 12 or whatever version in your country is, and then you go to university uh, and, you know, and then you graduate and you go to work, that's done. We are all lifelong learners now. Technology is moving too quickly. We need to have a much more targeted approach to education. It needs to be global. We need to start teaching a global understanding and life skills from an early age. And VR will actually let us do that. And to Florence's point about, you know, serving kind of more marginalized communities, you know, the notion of knowledge transfer can start today. And we can start engaging this wealth of wisdom that, you know, people who are older have amassed through their lives and can help us understand their journey to where they are today. They may not be advanced technologically, but they know their jobs better than anyone. Uh, and, and we can harness that knowledge. We can take it and build it into curriculum, uh, particularly for workforce development for the future. And that is a way to engage them so that they are not sort of aging out of technology. And then having the new generation take you know, what we've learned from past generations and, and build, draw that line and make, you know, that, that kind of, you know, exponential jump, you know, into the future, because this is about writing the story of the future. And again, if we're not engaged in what we want our futures to look like, you know, we're just, we're going to be, you know, kind of held hostage by technology. All of our fears, black mirror is going to happen, but we're in control of the technology today. And so, you know, we need to learn a little bit about it. Uh, we need to each be responsible for whatever sphere that we, you know, our sphere of influence, we need to be responsible for that sphere of influence to make sure that we're not leaving people behind. And, you know, this sounds like an insurmountable problem, but this is how things get done. We've been on our heels dealing with COVID, but we've done it as successfully as possible. And we've done it globally. 
So imagine if we harness this level of energy and get in, start to get in front of these problems and act globally towards how we want to change the future and how we want to you know, be more inclusive and solve some of these, these infrastructure issues. Very, very valid points, Amy. Thank you so much. Um, is there anyone else I would like to contribute? Um, Florence, I would want to call on you if, if you're willing to um, add just some uh, remarks to what Amy just said, because I'm sure you've been working to tackle this issue and have seen how um, this solution, like the solutions towards really helping mitigate the digital divide are sometimes... Uh, not the smoothest. <laughs> so. Absolutely. And, and, and Amy really toots, toots, toots my own, if I can use this expression. Um, and listening to her and to all of us and, and, and to Orlando as well, I, uh, and of course I said, I think I'm also thinking of the, the resistance factor. You know, all human beings are, have a factor of resistance to changes and learning. And, um, Having been uh, involved at different level of, of the education process, I, I see the resistance there. I mean, um, it's fantastic to think about all the learning opportunities, whether for the older adults or the younger learners, that online learning could offer. It gives me the chills. But I'm also thinking of the professoral uh, profession that uh, you know would be, I think resisting maybe to this idea of having online learning for different reasons. I'm thinking about the resistance of uh, the idea of community for younger learners, again, you know, being separated, as, as Amy mentioned. I think there is also the, you know, the dark side of technology. So as, as important it is that we all find solutions and work very hard on, and very fast. Somebody mentioned nine months, I'm not sure, but uh, on these solutions, uh, it's also very important that we understand and be tolerant of the resistance we are going to meet. I'm not sure anybody would want to add to that or, or contradict me. <laughs> I, I think you're very well aware. I, I think that's exactly why earlier on, Amy and John were both pointing at the fact that it has to be a collaborative solution, but there have to be incentives on both sides of the mark. Oh, Sam, Sam, are you able to join us again? Hi, Sam. Yeah, I'm here. No, actually, oh. I, I wanted to add to the point that Amy made earlier, which uh, around the incentive, which I think is, is really important, that, you know, there needs to be some kind of commercial incentive for, for these projects to actually move forward. And... Uh, this is precisely what, what we've been working on for the last two years, mainly helping c content creators, whether you're building games or education experience in VR or others to actually have an incentive to create that content, um, effectively building a business model for those, for the digital world. And, um, what we've seen is we were able to, you know, help small creators who, um, otherwise would not really have any way to, to generate revenue and, using solutions like that are able to create amazing content and generate revenue through advertising, sponsorship, product placement, or whatever it may be. So um, I think, you know, we, we talked about people consuming that technology, but people creating them is also getting more and more democratized. So as it gets easier to create that content, this will, of course, create more um, available content for, for people who can then consume it. Um, so that's basically um, how we're seeing immersive, immersive tech, right? You have incredible apps, entertainment apps, um, education, and um, the key we discuss is we, we really need to make sure that people have access to them. That's the double-edged sword uh, because, of course, we can create all this content, but many people do not have access to the VR headset and other technologies. So I think by creating that incentive, we'll be able to to help with that distribution. And I, I know we only have uh, like 50 seconds left, but Sam, I wanna make sure that you have uh, a little bit more of a voice. So if, is there any chance you could elaborate a little bit on what you think those are, like what are some proper economic incentives? Mainly it's around being able to monetize. So specifically what we're doing, right? We're talking about 
creating immersive content and f- finding out ways to to monetize this content, um, giving incentives to the creators so that they create more content. And the more popular the content is, the more reward they get so they can reinvest in creating more content. So it's bringing existing business models like advertising or sponsorship into the technologies of tomorrow, VR and AR, and creating a business model that is um, in line with the media itself. Okay, well, our time is up. Thanks, everyone, for joining, okay? <laughs> I want to take a quick screen job of, uh, of all of us, if we could, very quickly. No, Sam, stay. <laughs> Let's do this. And there's another tool we can use to, to do this. There we go, group selfie, start the group file. Okay, one, two, and three. <laughs> Yes, everyone take a picture. Okay. Um, great. Nice. Did everyone take it? I think Sam, you're missing. How I does it work? I, I'm not sure what I have to I do. So on the oh. platform itself, if you're on a mobile, you can take a little group file and the virtual. Oh, group right, right, right. I thought you were taking it for us. Cool. I, think I, I took mine, mine, but there's another way of doing a better one where you can actually smile. <laughs> You guys, were you guys not seeing me the whole time? Because I was. No, we couldn't. It seemed like you had dropped. I had dropped, but I, I, I came back Good. towards the middle of it. So I, I was wondering if you guys that. could hear me at all. I was getting um, a little nervous that we had totally. Uh, that's all right. No worries. I had trouble with for some reason. I got got disconnected and I couldn't couldn't access the link anymore. Yes, of course. Technology, as I was saying when you dropped <laughs> off, I was like, beautiful promise, rarely ever fulfilled. Or anyways, thanks everyone. I know this was really quick. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get more questions in, um, but thanks everyone for your participation. I hope you found it useful. If you're able to attend one of the final sessions, by all means, I'd love to see you there. And I'm sure Frank would too. So thanks again for your time. And Sam, I'm really sorry you had some technical issues. Oh, Sam, that's all right. No problem. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did a great job. Thanks, thanks, thanks so much. much. Yeah, great Thank job. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Have a great Bye. rest of your day. Right. Bye.